My guess uh, would be that the Fed's gonna need to go further. You're gonna have to be up in the four and a half, five range to uh, get inflation uh, meaningfully uh, down. In the near term, yes, inflation is very high and that does carry its own risk of momentum. On the other hand, uh, the high uh, energy prices are eating into at, at disposable incomes, it's reducing consumption. We're here to show the country that we're getting through this pandemic. We live in serious times. We're coming through a devastating pandemic and we have to stay vigilant. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Economic havoc. China's factory and services activity plunge amid lockdowns with President Xi under mounting pressure to support growth. Ending dependence, Germany says it could reduce reliance on Russian oil by late summer, but Hungary vows to veto any EU sanctions on the nation's energy. Plus, bargain hunting, Warren Buffett undertakes his biggest shopping spree in at least a decade, splashing $41 billion on company stakes, including Chevron, last quarter. Let's check in then on these markets. There's a bit of sour sentiment after the sell-off, the pronounced sell-off that we saw on Wall Street on Friday. The Nasdaq falling uh, more than 4%. The S&P and the Nasdaq down uh, to lows that we haven't seen, the biggest drops that we've seen uh, since 20. At 20, readjusting, of course, to the expectations around inflation and, of course, concerns about whether or not you get into recessionary territory as central banks turn more hawkish. You heard Larry Summers in the, in the headlines there talking about 4.5% uh, potentially for the Fed in order to get inflation under control. Deutsche Bank says it could be more like 5 to 6%. Of course, the Fed meeting on Wednesday, the commentary and what we hear from Jay Powell as well, the market's expecting a 50 basis point hike. The Bank of England follows on Thursday. The UK markets are closed for a bank holiday. Here's what you're seeing across the benchmark now. Down at 2.5% across the benchmark. When it comes to technology, this is technology, of course, that sector. Down 3.5%, 3.6% on the back of those rising yields. You ended Friday close to 3% on the US 10-year. So again, money being taken out of Treasuries, yields higher on those expectations of a more hawkish Fed. And again, whatever Jay Powell says on Wednesday will be crucial. The Bloomberg dollar index, you're seeing further gains there of more than a tenth of a percent. King dollar is one of the headlines that we have on the Bloomberg today. That strength that we've seen for the greenback, just so significant for such a range of assets. Of course, EM is under pressure as well as this, and you're seeing what's happening uh, with the Japanese yen. In terms of copper futures, we're drawing this to your attention because of what's happening in China and that weaker economic data. We'll break down that story for you shortly, but the economic data just points again to concerns about the trajectory for that economy and, of course, what that means for demand for raw materials like copper, down 2.6%. Let's switch it on and see how things are playing out across Europe there. Then with our map, just to note again, the FTSE, of course, is closed. The UK is on a bank holiday. The DAX seeing losses of 1.4%. We're hearing, of course, and we'll unpack that story as well around the geopolitics in Germany saying that maybe it could wean itself off Russian oil uh, by the summer. Gas is a different question. The Cat Cajon is lower by 2.7%. Earnings are coming through as well later this week. Following last week, we'll continue to flesh out the picture in terms of how supported these corporates are when it comes to margins amidst this high inflationary pressure. And then supply chain constraints that are emanating out of China as well. You're seeing losses of more than 3% on the FTSE MIB over in Italy. That is a picture then. Broad weakness here in Europe following on from what we saw on Wall Street and Friday and then concerning data around China. And talking of China, the stringent lockdowns to curb COVID-19 infections are taking a significant toll, as I said, on the economy. They're roiling the markets there as well. You've seen that weakness, particularly pronounced in the Yuan, and they're roiling global supply chains. Maybe there's going to be more inflation on the back of that. Oil declined, the offshore Yuan weakened in the latest, in the wake of the latest Chinese data. Let's bring in then Bloomberg's managing editor for global business in Asia, Emma O'Brien, and Bloomberg markets editor Christine Aquino. Emma, let's start with you. There seem to be cautious signs of optimism in China around the lockdown that we're seeing in Shanghai. The numbers started to come down, but in Beijing, there's still a focus on the outbreaks there. Where are we when it comes to the spread of Omicron in both Shanghai and Beijing and what success officials and policymakers have in pursuing that COVID zero policy? 
Yeah, well, in Shanghai, after what has been the worst outbreak of the pandemic for those guys, we, we definitely are seeing a, a tailing off and a plateauing of the cases. Under 10,000 new cases for two days in a row thus far, but not yet accompanied by any sort of easing. You can tell they're very nervous about... Uh, uh, letting off pressure and, and, and easing this lockdown in case this does come roaring back. And you do have cases, as I said, in the thousands. Over in Beijing, it's a very different story. Uh, they started imposing restrictions and that mass testing, uh, basically the entire city, very early on. You have seen cases just hovering around uh, sort of the 40s and 50s, 41 new cases for Sunday, uh, down from uh, almost 60 the day before. Uh, so we're not seeing that doubling uh, in new infections that we did see at the start of the Shanghai uh, wave, which was so very concerning. Still, uh, we're not seeing a lockdown in Beijing, but we are seeing various moves. Uh, they've banned uh, dining in and restaurants for the course of the May Day holiday, which runs until Wednesday. Gyms are closed. Schools are being put on holiday a little bit early. Um, and, and public places, you do need to show a clear COVID test. So um, very, very strong restrictions there to make sure that Beijing doesn't turn into another Shanghai. OK, the rigid restrictions remaining in place in China, of course, consequences then when it comes to supply chains, that consumer demand out of China as well. To what extent is the China factor now playing in to European markets? I want to bring Christine Aquino in here at this point because we're seeing significant pressure across European stocks this morning. Part of that, presumably, down to the data we're seeing out of China and the readjustment to the fact that this is going to be a slowing economy, maybe not convinced that the rhetoric that we're hearing from officials like President Xi Jinping, that they're really going to step up materially to support that economy. Christine where do things stand on this front? Well, Tom, it's definitely a big factor for Europe and really the rest of the world. I mean, if we just listen to some of the comments from the big company CEOs who have reported earnings over the last couple of weeks, China was the one big concern that was really a common factor across all of them. Whether it relates to supply chain issues or issues regarding demand, China really was something that a lot of executives are very, very worried about. And so I think this is feeding through to the broader market sentiment as well, where people are really realizing that this impact from China, both in terms of the economic slowdown, as well as what we're seeing from the lockdowns, is here to stay. It will persist likely into the next quarter, possibly into um, uh, beyond the second half of, of this year. And, you know, it's something that investors, I think, are really just starting to realize just how much it, it ranges across whether it, we're talking about company earnings or economic data and potentially a wild card that investors will have to deal with for the rest of the year. And Emma, of course, you're across the business space, the corporate business space across Asia and particularly China as well. What are you seeing? Because we're hearing from officials saying, look, we're going to try and ease up supply chain constraints. We'll prioritize foreign invested companies. What are you and the team seeing when it comes to the impact on corporates in China and Asia and those supply chain constraints? Well, there definitely has been disruption, of course, early on uh, in, in some of the lockdowns for Shenzhen, uh, which ended a lot uh, more quickly, and, and now Shanghai. You did see shutdowns of companies uh, like Tesla, for example, uh, a lot of the other automakers. Uh, you've, you've just exited out of a very long and brutal uh, lockdown in, uh, in, in the north east of China where uh, a fair bit of automaking is done, a plant of, of Toyota and Volkswagen up there closed for more than a month. Uh, so they are seeing impact, but you uh, you are seeing a, a bit of a reality of this uh, message from Xi Jinping that uh, COVID zero needs to be done with the economy in mind. And you're seeing things like these uh, closed loop or bubble type arrangements so that factories can keep working with the staff sort of working, living and working on co on campus or at the factory in some cases, constantly tested to keep COVID out. Uh, and that did work uh, quite well for, for some time. But then you had sort of other aspects of the supply chain, uh, trucks, uh, logistics, trucking uh, companies uh, stuck without staff because of lockdowns and COVID cases. That meant that uh, some of these factories couldn't get the materials that they needed. So they could work because they had the workers, but they couldn't, uh, they didn't have the materials to do it. So they're, these are the sort of things that they're grappling with um, as they try and do COVID zero uh, without that disruption, uh, according to Xi's di direction. 
Okay, Emma O'Brien, editor for Global Business, uh, joining us out of Sydney. Thank you very much indeed. Christina Kino, of course, uh, walking through some of the key market themes. China, a central factor today. And coming up, we are going to discuss what's happening when it comes to the lockdowns in China, the economic implications. We'll be breaking that down with Karsten Brzezinski, ING's global head of macro research and chief economist for Germany. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie. Let's check in on these markets then across Europe. The UK, the FTSE 100 is closed for a bank holiday. We're an hour and 12 minutes into the open for the rest of those markets. You've seen some pretty pronounced volatility. Investors, of course, analysts and strategists have been telling us, look, prepare for more volatility as central banks adjust to higher inflation. We've certainly seen that just in today's session. But this is a two-day chart. You're seeing losses there uh, currently on the one day of 1.2%. This is across two days, though, of the stocks uh, 600. You saw this remarkable drop. Uh, just uh, a couple of minutes ago across the stock 600. We'll work out what's going on there. But clearly, uh, nervousness and anxiety around what is happening. Uh, the China story, of course, but also as we lead up to that Fed decision on Wednesday. We'll keep across uh, the market moves for you. But certainly, you're down more than 1% across uh, the Kakahant, the DAX, uh, the FTSE MIB. FTSE MIB down 1.5%. Every single sector now uh, here in Europe in uh, the red. Let's get back to what's happening in China then. Shanghai's COVID-19 cases coming in below 10,000 on Sunday. That's the second day in a row. And a sign that the outbreak is continuing to ease. Major restrictions on movement, though, are still in place. Meanwhile, cinemas and gyms have been closed across Beijing for the Labor Day holiday. The city found 41 new cases on Sunday. That's down from 59 the previous day. And it has activated a makeshift hospital. Amid the disruption, we are seeing, of course, hits to growth. The nation's economic activity contracted sharply in April as COVID-19 restrictions hit hard. Factory output hit its lowest level in more than two years, with the official manufacturing PMI figure falling to 47.4, firmly in contractionary territory, from 49.5 in March. We are joined now by Carsten Brzezinski, ING's global head of macro research and chief economist for Germany. And Carsten, I want to start with, Germany, with China and to what extent the slowdown in China is going to start to flow across to Europe and whether indeed it has to change the calculation for the ECB. Well, it definitely has. Um, what's going to happen? We in Europe is extremely depending on exports going to China. And I think of uh, around six percent of European exports going to China. If China now slows down, we're going to feel this in a climate in which European exports are going to suffer anyhow. Well, and then add to that the uh, supply chain frictions, and we we know from last year's experience how severe these supply chain frictions have an impact on European industry. Because don't forget, for example, the German industry has still not returned to pre-pandemic levels. And now with these ongoing frictions, new disruptions in supply chains, um, the German manufacturing sector plus the European manufacturing sector in general will suffer this year, which means we have to revise downwards, I think, all the growth prospects and also the ECB will have to. What, what does that mean then for your growth targets for the year for, for Europe, Carsten? And where have you revised those down to? Well, we're, we're still not going for, for an outright stagnation or a recession, but this has to do with the fact that we have such a big statistical carryover effect from 2021 into 2022. So even with an almost stagnating European economy, we would end up with GDP growth of around 2%. This is what we're currently expecting. I think the risks, as the ECB always calls it, are clearly tilted to the downside. Inflation, also on the back of these ongoing supply chain frictions, will turn out to be higher to where we think in terms of around 6 7% for the Eurozone, risks tilted to the upside. And facing this kind of stagflation makes the situation for the ECB so much trickier than, for example, the situation for the Fed. What, what do you think they end up prioritizing? Is it inflation? Is it that supply chain hit? Or is it the growth slowdown? What for them is most important when it comes to addressing that risk? I think they have a two-phase strategy. And phase one mm. is normalizing monetary policy. What does this mean? Normalizing means bringing end to the crisis measures. Stop net asset purchases. 
and end the era of negative deposit rates. So there is consensus about it. And this could actually already happen over the summer months. Um, but then the open thing is, once we are back at a deposit rate of zero, no net asset purchases, then I think the ECB will again prioritize growth over inflation. So we have this two-pillar or two-phase normalization strategy. Um, and I do not really expect a long series of rate highs coming from the ECB, contrary to what we currently expect for the Fed. OK, Carlson Brzezewski from ING stays with us there on the two sides, the two phases of this approach by the ECB. We'll get more, of course, on his insights uh, across Europe and, of course, what it means when Europe is looking to reduce its dependency on Russian energy and the read across to growth there as well. Let's get the Bloomberg First Word news now, though, with Laura Wright. Laura. Thanks, Tom. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi met with Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky on Saturday during an unannounced visit to Kyiv. Pelosi said the visit sent a message to the world that America stands firmly with Ukraine. She's the highest U.S. official to travel to the country since the Russian invasion. China's economic activity contracted sharply in April as COVID-19 restrictions hit hard. Factory output hit its lowest level in more than two years, with the official manufacturing PMI figure falling to 47.4 from 49.5 in March. It was the first April data set to reflect the impact of COVID lockdowns, which have shut factories and disrupted consumption. And President Joe Biden offered up some jokes at the annual White House Correspondents' Dinner, an event that had been on pause due to the pandemic. The president took aim at his predecessor. This is the first time the president attended this dinner in six years. It's understandable. We had a horrible plague, followed by two years of COVID. Global news 24 hours a day on air and at Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg, Tom. Laura, thank you. Coming up, traders are expecting the Fed to go big this week as the US central bank vies with inflation levels that have not been seen in a generation. And what does that mean for markets? More from Karsten Brzezinski next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Fed Chair Jerome Powell is expected to shift the needle this week on how high investors expect the US central bank to raise interest rates. Powell and his colleagues are trying to cool surging prices without, of course, triggering a recession. Carsten Brzezinski from ING is still with us. And Carsten, Jay Powell, in his most recent comments, has suggested he's pretty confident that they can engineer a soft landing for the US economy. Do you agree? Well, I think in the first month they can, and that's what I expect. They will go for 50 basis points this, this, this week, and then I'll expect another two times 50 basis points before the summer or at the start of the summer. And this should help um, bring a soft landing. If we really were to see the Fed going to what some expect them to do, to 5% or even higher, I'm a bit afraid that this will not lead up to a soft landing, but rather a hard landing. OK, so, so whether or not you get up to that 5% is a level uh, that would likely tip the U.S. economy into recession. We're in a unique period, though, where we're also getting the runoff of the balance sheet, or at least that's the expectation in May. And you layer that on top of the rate hike cycle. Just help us understand what that means for financial conditions. They'll tighten, of course. But have markets really priced this in? Are they able to price this in, given that this is a pretty unprecedented moment? No, I don't think that markets are really, um, we have really entirely priced all of this in. Um, because this indeed is for the first time ever that we really see such a tightening of financing conditions, a hiking of interest rates. And not only in the US, but as we know, Bank of England, European Central mm -hmm. Bank, other major central banks will follow already, have started to tighten monetary policy. This is a new era in which central banks now really try to somehow normalize monetary policy and even tighten it further. And on top of that, we still have uncertainties. We have the supply chain frictions. We have the war in Ukraine. And all of this will weigh on European growth, 
I find it hard to see that if it weighs on European growth, it will not weigh on global growth. And therefore, we could very well be in a situation at the end of this year in which the global economy again starts to slow down with much higher interest rates. Can we in any way rely on households and the consumer to support the economy? Well, there are a couple of households, especially the higher income households, uh, which have excess savings. And they, for a while, will be able to offset the loss in purchasing power on the back of higher energy prices, on the back of higher inflation. But, you know, there will also be an end to how much they can do. Plus, we have the lower income households, which in no way will be able to really offset higher energy, higher food prices. So I would not be surprised to see a weakening of private consumption in the second half of this year. OK, always such clarity. Carsten Brzezki from ING, Global Head of Macro Research and Chief Economist for Germany. Thank you for those insights. Coming up, we're going to focus on the European Union. It's attempts to wean itself off Russian oil. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Economic havoc, China's factory and services activity plunge amid lockdowns with President Xi under mounting pressure to support growth. Ending dependence, Germany says it could reduce reliance on Russian oil by late summer, but Hungary vows to veto any EU sanctions on the nation's energy. Plus, bargain hunting. Warren Buffett undertakes his biggest shopping spree in at least a decade, splashing $41 billion on company stakes, including Chevron, last quarter. Good morning. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. We'll check in on your markets an hour and a half into the trading session here in Europe. The UK has closed the FTSE 100 for a bank holiday. You're seeing losses across the benchmark of 1.2%, but there's been very a very volatile session, weighing up, of course, the weaker data out of China, leading up to what's happening on Wednesday with that Federal Reserve decision with markets, of course, pricing in a 50 basis point hike. But arguably more important, it is the commentary from Jay Powell on the back of that decision that will be in focus. The future state side looking at gains, the S&P E-minis of four-tenths of a percent after the bloodletting that we saw on Friday. The dollar index just continued strength for the greenback, up almost two-tenths of a percent. And we are focused on copper as well, reacting to that fragility out of China. The futures there looking at losses of 2.8 percent. President Xi talks about infrastructure spending, but the data suggests that the economy uh, continues to be weak. And, of course, question marks over the demand then for materials like copper. OK, uh, we are going to check some of the individual stocks that are on the move as well at the open. A number of interesting corporate stories. Vestas coming in and downgrading their forecasts for the full year and suggesting, in fact, for the first time in a decade, they could post a loss. That stock is down uh, almost 7%. They're concerned, of course, they say part of this is down to their retrenchment from the Russian market, but also supply chain woes that have dogged that company for months. Adler Group, some controversy there, members of the board quitting. That stock down 43%. Their auditors, KPMG, refusing to sign off on their latest set of results. We continue to keep across the country a company uh, that has been under short seller pressure uh, for a number of months. And Tui Travel uh, down just 1%. Uh, their CEO, according to Reuters, coming and saying that they added an additional 1.3 million uh, journeys, saying that's going to boost margins and profits as they look to get to pre-pandemic levels of demand. Let's get back to what's happening across the energy space then and what we're hearing from officials in Brussels. European energy ministers are holding a special meeting in the Belgian capital today as pressure grows on the EU to curtail Russian oil imports as the war in Ukraine continues. It comes after Bloomberg News reported officials are discussing a new package of sanctions that could see a phase-out announced as soon as this week. The CEO of Ukraine's Naftogaz says that he does not see a full European cutoff from Russian gas. I don't uh, really think that we should anticipate um, a full cutoff uh, of uh, Europe from Russian gas. Uh, although uh, we advocate and others are advocating a full embargo on na natural gas as well, but it would probably take some time. OK, for more, we go to our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, who is following that meeting in Brussels for us. Maria, uh, what is being discussed then? 
Well, Tom, we're expecting uh, this meeting to happen in a few hours now here in Brussels. Now, of course, it will be all about oil and that embargo. I would say it's a light embargo because, as you know, we've been reporting uh, for a few hours now that this is uh, going to be a gradual phase out from Russian oil imports into the European Union. And there could be a transition uh, period predominantly so that the German industry can adjust to this. Now, in that condition, the German government would be in a position to drop its veto. By the way, Tom, today we're expecting Robert Habeck, remember this is a German vice chancellor, but also economy minister and climate minister, to come here to Brussels and attend this meeting personally. Now, why is this happening now? Well, Tom, there's two figures that I want to give to you, and that is the Russian dependency of energy going into Germany it really has been reduced majorly from last year to now. Germany says, and I want to run you through some of the numbers here, that oil has dropped from 35 percent import last year to now 12 and when you look at gas that's a big geopolitical weapon it's dropped from 55 percent last year to now 35 percent so as you can see here for germany oil would be easier to ditch and doing it by the end of the year based on those numbers seems doable yeah, so they have actually made some progress on that front. As you say, oil, arguably the easy bit, gas, more difficult. Hungary, though, potentially throwing a spanner in the works when it comes to these discussions. Yes, and, and, and Tom, uh, you know, uh, a warning perhaps uh, from Viktor Orban's mm. spokesman uh, today, this morning, in anticipation of this meeting, saying, no, we have not dropped our veto. We do not believe an energy embargo would solve uh, the war. Remember, Viktor Orban has been very much criticized for perhaps being too cozy uh, with the Russians, but they still say they don't see would put an end to the war and also suggest that an embargo would have a very big detrimental impact on the European economy and certainly the Hungarian economy. I mean, a lot of this, a new controversy after the Hungarian government last week also said they would be in favor of paying in rubles. So this is a standoff. It is problematic because every sanction uh, package has to be approved in unanimity by the EU 27. But I would point to two things as we talked about uh, previously on the show. When it comes to Viktor Orban, you have to make a difference uh, between what he says publicly, the bravado that comes with it. There's a lot of testosterone at times. And then what he does behind the scenes, which is for for the time being, he's always approved every sanctions package that the EU has put on the table until now. It's been five of them. The question is whether he's going to also approve this one, which would be the sixth one. OK, Bloomberg's European correspondent Maria today on the testosterone of Viktor Orban there of Hungary. Coming up, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz is planning to woo Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi with a special invitation to the G7 summit. We'll break down international relations next, what it means as Europeans and NATO allies try to realign with India on the question of Russia. That is it. Uh, coming up next, this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. We want to check oil prices for you because you've seen a bit of a sharp drop uh, coming on the back, arguably of concerns about demand out of China, but also at a time when the Europeans are meeting, as Maria today was telling us, in Brussels to decide how far and how fast they want to go to reduce uh, that demand uh, for Russian oil. So you're seeing uh, WTI uh, down currently at 101, $101, so down 2.6%. Brent is $104 a barrel, down at 2.5%. So some pressure uh, on oil prices, and we'll keep across that story for you. OK, let's get back to what is happening then uh, when it comes to the geopolitics of that conflict uh, in Ukraine. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz plans to invite Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi as a special guest to a group of seven leaders summit held in Germany next month. That's a bid by the Germans to sway India into joining the international alliance against Russia, which the Indians have so far been reluctant to do. We are now joined by our German government reporter in Berlin, Birgit Yenen. And Birgit, uh, is German's G7 invite, is, is it significant? Is it symbolic? Is it likely to sway India in any way? 
I mean, I do think it is uh, significant and, and symbolic, really. It, it, it does show that Germany is really keen to basically avoid that the global order becomes fractured after the Russian war, because German government is really concerned that really the, the, the block building between two separate sides uh, will become uh, enhanced after the war. So therefore, and, and, and India has been really staying very neutral in this conflict, has not supported the sanctions, even increased sort of the imports of, of oil from Russia, and also has not condemned Russia. So therefore, the, the government has been looking into ways of how to basically reach out to India in order to make, to, to, to give India a chance to align with the West. But how India is going to respond, that obviously is not yet clear because they have been um, trying to basically do go, go two sides and we will have to see how, how Modi is going to respond. Yeah, and presumably the, the incentives from Germany beyond this, this uh, approachment to the, G, the G7 uh, are, are going to be in focus from the Indian side, a country, of course, which is heavily dependent, as Germany is, on, on energy from, from Russia. They have that huge dependency. What is Germany's plan more broadly to kind of strengthen that relationship with India? Well, I, I think the biggest potential is still the e economic links. And, and Germany is looking towards... Um, opening up the, the labor market here to get some of skilled labor from India to, to Germany. And there is a need also in Germany, obviously, to have uh, IT specialists. So this is one offer sort of on the table. The other thing is basically to, to export know-how and, and climate technology to China and help China, uh, sorry, help India in that way to basically, uh, you know, move in, uh, forward in uh, developing its economy. OK, so maybe that's where the secret sauce lies for the Germans, is part of that technology, that innovation expertise and that demand from India. Birgit, thank you. Uh, Birgit Yenin, our Berlin bureau chief. And let's pivot then from German politics to German industry, the two, of course, interlinked. German companies are in a tight spot, of course. If the war in Ukraine escalates, it could lead to that embargo on Russian coal, Russian coal, oil and gas, which in turn leads to restrictions on German industry. Joining us to shed light on German business and its entanglement with Russian energy is our Frankfurt bureau chief, Christoph Rauwald. Christoph, uh, what is the biggest risk, the most pertinent risk, the most salient risk for German companies relating and when it comes to Russian energy imports? Yeah, hi, Tom. Uh, the, the biggest risk clearly uh, lies in a potentially abrupt cutoff from uh, Russian gas. The, 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 the situation regarding uh, coal and oil can be managed. It's going to make things um, more, more expensive for, for German manufacturers. But uh, the, the, the bigger immediate threat would be a potential cutoff from gas, just because uh, the, the, many of the, like, the large industrial sites in Germany, including like BASF's Ludwigshafen factory, that's one of the world's biggest chemical factories, is directly linked to Russian gas imports via a pipeline system. So any sort of change to that, any abrupt change, would, uh, would definitely be a major issue. And how alive to the risks are German corporates and what have they been doing specifically to try and mitigate these concerns? Yeah, many of the big industrial manufacturers have like, reviewed the, their operations to identify certain areas or, or, or business operations that, uh, that can actually or have a bit more like strategic leeway in terms of like, how they operate, uh, maybe scale down energy consumption somewhat or temporarily idle. Uh, if, if, if the gas supply would be uh, cut off. But in other areas, it's much more difficult. And it also has to be noted that for, for many of like, the big uh, German manufacturers, uh, it's, it, it's something that they can do. But many of the, of the small and medium-sized companies, and they sort of form the backbone of the German economy, that's a much more difficult task to do. So for them, they're, they're quite often more specialized in, in what they do in their operations. But uh, it's, it's basically a, a big issue for, for, for all companies across the globe, uh, uh, across the country and across all industries, actually. And Christoph, can you walk through with us which sectors in Germany are most affected by this? Yeah, the utilities are, are directly affected. Uh, Unipa has been uh, mentioned in the past. Uh, they had a couple of days ago flagged um, a, a major write down, uh, a potential loss. Um, and uh, so the, the impact on the utilities is, is, is more immediate. 
but it's it, it basically affects like especially all the manufacturers very heavily that have a very high energy energy consumptions uh, that uh, operate like big industrial manufacturing operations. Uh, for example, the glass industries, producer of glass, uh, they require a lot of energy. Uh, in, in, in some cases, uh, it's, it's, it's about half or two thirds of their revenue is actually energy cost. So for them, that's, that's it, they're, they're just in a really, really difficult spot at the moment. Okay, Christoph Rauwald, our Frankfurt bureau chief, on the complexity of delinking German corporates from <coughs> that Russian energy supply. Thank you uh, for joining us and breaking that down for us. Okay, uh, we've got lots more coming up, including Warren Buffett's buying spree, the Oracle of Omaha, snapping up $41 billion in stocks. That's the most in at least a decade. We will break down the details. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. Let's check in on the markets then. Almost two hours into the European trading day on a day when for the UK it is a bank holiday. There is no trading here, but across the rest of the European space there is. And there's pretty significant losses. 1.2, 1.3%. Readjusting to the data, a significant miss, particularly when it comes to services out of China. Concerns about the continuing lockdowns there. And, of course, what happens with the central banks, j and the Fed, on Wednesday. Markets pricing in a 50 basis point hike. And, of course, we're looking for anything j has to say about the rate and trajectory of rate hikes along with the balance sheet. The futures stateside pointing again, three-tenths of a percent. That's modest when you look at the losses, significant losses you saw across Wall Street on Friday, particularly pronounced and the tech-heavy Nasdaq. The Bloomberg dollar index continued strength there, up almost two-tenths of a percent for the greenback in an environment, of course, of high yields. What that means for EM and other assets is a focus. You've seen the yen continuing to be under pressure, still at around 130 uh, for the yen versus the US dollar. Copper, that is down 2.7 percent. That's also tied to the China story, that concern about demand from uh, the world's second largest economy, down 2.7% when it comes to copper futures. Dr. Copper, a signal there around the health of China's economy. Let's get to what was happening over the weekend on Saturday, particularly in Omaha, Nebraska. Berkshire Hathaway holding their annual shareholder meeting. It was the first in-person meeting since 2019. Bloomberg's Laura Wright was across the event for us. Blue, uh, Bloomberg's Laura Wright. Let me just repeat that just in case people missed it. What was the key takeaway for you then from uh, the event? What do we hear from Warren Buffett and his buying spree that we've seen over the last quarter? Well, Tom, this was the largest buying spree since records began at Berkshire Hathaway back in 2008. It explains why the seventh largest component of the S&P 500 is trading positively in the pre-market. And that buying spree was primarily driven by a thesis that buying companies is more advantageous than share buybacks in the current environment. Cash on the balance sheet stands at just over $100 billion, down from $144 billion at the end of 2021, but still higher than Warren Buffett's comfort threshold, which is $30 billion. He sees cash like oxygen. Folks over at Berkshire Hathaway still vehemently against cryptocurrencies. Buffett and Munger outlined that they prefer productive assets such as farmland or property. But overall, analysts at Bloomberg Intelligence see the diverse portfolio of businesses as a way to transcend inflation and supply chain woes at Berkshire Hathaway. So $41 billion in terms of stock purchases in the first quarter. What is he even be buying, Laura? Well, during the first quarter, Berkshire Hathaway, they've increased their stake in companies like HP and Occidental Petroleum. But most notably are the higher stakes in the energy company Chevron and the gaming company Activision Blizzard. Starting with Chevron, that stake now stands at just shy of $26 billion, a significant increase from less than $5 billion at the end of 2021. Activision Blizzard, will Microsoft have a bid in for this company at $69 billion? And this is a classic <coughs> deal arbitrage play from Warren Buffett and co. They've increased their stake to 9.5% from less than 2% at the end of last year, which signals their conviction that the deal will pass. Another thesis for the team, it's any deal, go big or go home. If I'm anywhere close to this active when I'm 91 or 98 in the case of Charlie Munger, I will be very impressed and very content indeed. What is the succession planning around Berkshire Hathaway? What do we know about this? 
No updates on succession for 91-year-old Warren Buffett or 98-year-old Charlie Munger than what we learned last year that the most likely heir apparent is Greg Abel. Now, during a five-hour Q&A session, attendees commented on the mental sharpness of both Buffett and Munger. But one interesting fact that Buffett did divulge that his successor is likely to face more scrutiny than he has been accustomed to. OK, Bloomberg's Laura Wright, I'll get it eventually, on the succession plans at Berkshire Hathaway and that huge buying spree in the first quarter, $41 billion. Let's get to what's happening with one corporate in Germany, the plight of a real estate investment company, Adler. It is plunging this morning, absolutely hammered, down more than 40%. That's after its auditors refused to sign off on its latest set of results. KPMG said that there was not enough evidence to give an opinion on the numbers. And most of Adler's incumbent board has resigned. Joining us now is Luca Casiraghi, our distressed debt reporter in Milan. Luca, this is just the latest twist in the Adler saga. How has the company responded? This is no minor thing when the auditor steps down, as you well know. Uh, correct. So the company, so far, so there is a, a, um, a good press conference uh, ongoing <coughs> at the moment with the chairman. Uh, trying to um, say that the results uh, the uh, KPMG actually gave, um, so these are uh, auditor results, but just there is a difference that KPMG couldn't give an opinion. And um, that would allow uh, Adler to respect covenants that are, very, are crucial to keep uh, bonds uh, uh, outstanding, so without really triggering any issue with, with, uh, with bondholders. Um, that most likely will be challenged by bondholders in the in the next few weeks uh but that's a legal battle that will um will, will may go on um in the next uh, uh, going forward um hmm. the main uh, this, this, this is a story that's been going on for now more than uh, more than six months um because it started off with uh, uh short seller allegations against the company um, of uh, malfeasance, of uh, issues with governance and valuation. And KPMG was appointed by the company back then to evaluate, to review um, these, these allegations and, and give a comment by the end of, for the 2021 uh, results. Uh, the deadline yeah. was on Saturday, so the 13th of April. And, um, and that's what happened. Yeah, and KPMG refusing to, to comment on, on those results. We have a line crossing now from the company saying that they can't say if they will reappoint uh, KPMG uh, as the auditor. They're also saying that a revolving credit facility ran out at the end of April. What is next then, uh, Luca, for Adler? Well, at the moment, it's very unclear. First, they will, uh, <coughs> they will need to address um, potential issues coming up for with their creditors, um, as you just said, uh, the revolving credit facility, uh, revolving credit facility with banks was terminated in April. It's not uh, entirely clear of all these, uh, the reason for that, but it may have to do with uh, again with the, um, uh, with the with the auditor results. Okay. Uh, bonds may Luca. bond holders may take it up. Luca Casaraghi, our distressed debt reporter in Milan on that important corporate story for the day. Stay with us. Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues. This is Bloomberg. I think it, it remains an extremely uncertain environment for all asset classes, and I think we're going to continue to see that volatility in, in, in all the markets. Of course, we've been on a roller coaster ride in terms of tech earnings. All of tech's in the penalty box. We're seeing a massive uh, downswing post pandemic hangover. I don't think it is the course of peak worry. Having a broadly diversified portfolio is probably you know, still the, the best uh, way, way to, to, to navigate this. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. It is Monday, May the 2nd, and these are our top stories. U.S. stocks stabilize after Friday's massive sell-off. European equities are still playing catch-up and are down hard. 
Weak Chinese PMI data is certainly not helping. Buffett, though, is buying and buying big. Berkshire Hathaway made $41 billion worth of net purchases in the first quarter. That's the most in at least a decade. And Hungary's red line. Prime Minister Viktor Orban says he will veto any EU attempt to sanction Russian energy. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson in London. Kriti Gupta and Kaylee Lines are in New York. Anna Edwards and Matt Miller are off today. Let's talk about what that session looked like over in Asia. Kaylee, what do we see? Well, of course, it was a really, really ugly end to the month of April and the month of May not starting off on the best footing, honestly, in Asia overnight, Guy. But that said, there were a lot of Asian markets closed today for holidays, including China and Hong Kong and Taiwan. Among those trading, though, they were mostly lower, including the Kospi in South Korea and the Nikkei 225 in Japan, which was down about a tenth of 1%. But, of course, the story in Japan really continues to be the currency story. The Japanese yen once again weaker against the dollar today. We sit at that 130 handle still around the weakest level in two decades for the yen due in large part to that rate differential story. But the real underperformance in Asian currencies today comes not from the yen, but the offshore Chinese yuan. And of course, that is after the data we got out of China over the weekend. Really, really weak. The worst reads on the manufacturing and services PMI since all the way in February 2020. Of course, the height of the initial COVID lockdowns. You're seeing the current lockdowns in places like Shanghai really taking their toll on the Chinese economy. As a result, the Chinese yuan trading at around 667 against the dollar. That's the weakest going back to 2020. And then, of course, that also fuels inflation fears, given it could exacerbate some supply uh, side challenges. And of course, inflation going to lead a number of central banks to likely tighten policy this week. Creating that includes the RBA, which is expected to hike tomorrow. That 10 year yield in Australia up more than 13 basis points overnight at 326 or so. That is the highest going all the way back to 2014, Creedy. Yeah, and Kaylee, some of that moves that you were talking about, the worst, those superlatives, the worst going back to 2020. Well, it's a similar story in the U.S. session as well. Remember, the S&P 500 closed April with the worst month since March of 2020. So you are seeing a little bit of a bounce back on this first trading day of May. The future's up about three-tenths of 1%. But this is something to keep in mind. Put this in the context of the volatility we've seen, because if you look cross-asset, you're not seeing that same risk-on feeling. For example, a 10-year yield pretty much unchanged despite having traded throughout the Asian session. The New York crude futures even down 3%. Once again, the growth outlook really going to be weighing on that commodity. Is that a predecessor of what you're going to see in the stock market later today? And of course, Bitcoin, the volatility of Bitcoin, 4% is the usual average move in one direction or the other right now, only seeing a 1.6% move, move to the upside. So, Guy, the question here is how much of this is actually going to hold into the open? Absolutely. It's going to be fascinating to see how May starts. Sally May, go away. Um, European equity vol gapping higher first thing this morning. That's interesting. We've also had some data out this morning. Let me just flag that to you. Confidence data, the headline number missing. Uh, the real details here, though, come in. Consumer down and down hard. Uh, and the uh, industrial number down and down hard. The services number reasonably stable. The headline number uh, for April coming through at 105. The estimate 108. So depressed uh, confidence here in Europe. Understandably, given what we see in front of us here, London's an outlier. It's closed today. Ignore it. Um, the DAX is down by 1%. The CAC is down by 1.75%. Uh, we are basically factoring in, in here uh, the closed Friday out of Wall Street, which we didn't fully deal with here in Europe, and also that poor Chinese data uh, that we got out overnight that we were just referencing. The DAX is down by 1%. Euro dollar uh, still trading with the 105 handle, but down today. Uh, the German Bund's catching a little bit of a bid today, which is interesting, and Brent crude, which is open today despite London being shut is actually down and down fairly hard the reason for that the Chinese data keep an eye though on this politics story surrounding EU energy and whether or not Hungary will actually uh, veto any attempt to sanction that uh, we'll talk about that in just a moment quick look at Russian assets just to show you what is happening here Russia had to dip in to its domestic dollar reserves to make a payment Friday it did so the ruble probably one of the only currencies right now Kaylee uh, that has actually had a fairly good month the last month against the US dollar currently trading 71.40. Uh, the, uh, the Russian stock market, uh, obviously a derivative factor of that, trading at 24.45 and the 10-year bund trading at 10.17. But it was interesting that they had to dip in to domestic reserves to make that payment Friday, Kaylee. 
Absolutely, really trying to avoid a default when it comes to Russia. That, of course, is something that we had earmarked for later on this week. Now, as for what else is happening this week, today Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi will be embarking on his first overseas trip this year. He'll visit Germany, Denmark, and France. Then, of course, a lot of central banks are coming down the pike. We get the Reserve Bank of Australia's policy meeting on Tuesday. That's tomorrow. Then on Wednesday comes the Fed rate decision and news conference with Chairman Jerome Powell. And that's followed by the Bank of England's rate decision on Thursday. Thursday. And then, of course, on Friday, we get the U.S. April jobs report. It's going to be a big week, Creedy. May starting out with a bang. Yeah, Kaylee, a lot to digest there. Let's see how much there is to digest this morning. U.S. stock index features rebounding from Friday's bruising sell-off. Wall Street's worst day in almost two years. Let's get more on the markets with Wilbur's Danny Berger. Danny. Ooh. Kriti, it was definitely a week to forget in and perhaps a month to forget for a lot of investors. This confluence of factors from the war in Ukraine to China's economic issues, as well as a Fed, of course, the big one here, set to tighten. Now, on Friday, adding insult to injury was this major sell-off in part sparked by the Employment Cost Index report that came in, rising its most since 1995. So you get this extreme sell-off that leads to even more superlatives. For the S&P, as you say, one of the worst days in two years years. The Nasdaq, its worst month since 2008. The dollar, its best month in about 10 years. Of course, this is also the rate story. It's also the rate differential story, as well as the haven story. The Japanese yen above 130 and U.S. 10-year yields uh, above one, two spot nine and the worst month for bonds on record. BMO also saying that Japanese institutional managers selling about $60 billion worth of bonds. So going back to this dollar yen rate differential story. Now, what does that do to the setup going into this week, a week when the Fed is supposed to tighten 50 basis points? Well, for our radio listening audience, I have the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index for the U.S. At the moment, financial conditions are the tightest, save for the pandemic, since 2018. In 2018, this is when the Fed was forced to pause because conditions had gotten so tight. It's the dollar moving higher. It's stocks selling off. All of those contributing, doing some of the work for the Fed. But if the Fed is set to continue on this rate path hike of 50 basis points this week and continuing down the road, just how much more destruction could we see in these markets? Danny, thanks very much indeed. It's going to be a big end to the week, isn't it? It's got an interesting start to the week in terms of the data we're already seeing. In China, coronavirus lockdown certainly taking a significant toll on the economy. Over the weekend, official data showed that both manufacturing and services activity plunging in April to their worst level in more than two years. Indexes for exports and imports also slumped. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie joins us now with the details. Tom, kind of pull apart the data for us. What is it telling us about where we are with the, with the Chinese So economy? services firmly in contractionary territory, around 42, so well below that 50 level. Manufacturing came roughly in line with the surveys, but also in contractionary territory. Here's what's really important. When you take apart the data, one key component that I looked at was the export data, the subcontract, the subcomponent within this data. Exports out of China are starting to soften. That was a pillar of support through 2021. Yeah. That is starting to crumble alongside, of course, Pre-pandemic was still not back to that retail health, that consumer health for China. That still never came back. And now exports are starting to weaken as well. So real concerns there for the Chinese economy. On the lockdowns, there's been some optimism that in, sh in Shanghai they're getting ahead of this now. The infection rates have come down, but you're still about six weeks into a lockdown there for many parts of that city. Beijing is on the edge as to whether they go into a lockdown yep. or, or not. And then, of course, you know, and we've been unpacking the supply chain constraints out of that. So what is going to happen on a policy response? The Politburo came out with that statement towards the end of last week saying we will meet those end-of-year targets. But what are the details? Is it going to be enough to offset the constraints we're seeing as a result of the lockdown? Xi Jinping has said he wants to step up in infrastructure spending. That's pulling the tools out of the old playbook, stepping up infrastructure spending. That draws in longer questions about the sustainability of China's economic health, given they had been trying to to build out their domestic yeah. demand. Now they're going back to infrastructure. What does that mean for debt loads? What does that mean for their longer term questions about trying to re-engineer this economy? The pressure is acute at this point. Back to the old playbook. Tom, thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Tom McKenzie on what's coming out of China. Let's go from Beijing to Brussels. European energy ministers are holding a special meeting in Brussels today as pressure grows on the EU to curtail Russian oil imports as the war in Ukraine continues. It comes after Bloomberg reported that officials are discussing a new package of sanctions that could see a phase-out announced as soon as this week. Let's go to Brussels now. Our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, is following the latest meeting in Brussels on this very subject. Maria, the, the, the question is whether or not everybody's on board with the idea that we're going to see energy sanctions right now, Hungary certainly could be a problem. 
Yeah, it could be. And it's funny because for a very long time, we talked about Germany and the fact that Germany had this veto uh, for Russian energy that they believe it would be incredibly detrimental to the German industry. And then, of course, over the weekend, we hear that the German authorities would now be open to this embargo, which I would call, by the way, an a light embargo, because it would be a gradual phase out and there would be a transition period for everyone to adjust from now until the end of the year. But nonetheless, the Germans are on board. While that is happening, you have Hungary today, the spokesman for Prime Minister Viktor Orban, saying that they haven't dropped this veto, that they still believe this is not going to put an end to the war and that Hungary is not in a position to accept this. I would just note one thing very quickly here. Viktor Orban is someone who has a lot of bravado, a lot of testosterone in public. But when you look at everything he's done behind the scenes in the past few months, he's always voted in favor of EU sanctions alongside everyone else. All right, Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo in Brussels for us. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi met Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky on Saturday during an unannounced visit to Kyiv. She's the highest U.S. official to travel to the country since the Russian invasion. Here's what she had to say at the meeting. We believe that we are visiting you uh, to say thank you uh, for your fight for freedom, that we are on a frontier of freedom, and that your fight is a fight for everyone. And so our commitment is to be there for you until the fight is done. Anne-Marie Horder, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now from D.C. Anne-Marie, how significant was this visit? Well, it's incredibly significant, Kaylee, if you think about the fact, as you mentioned, that she is now the highest ranking U.S. official to enter the country since Russia invaded Ukraine. And she wasn't alone. She came with another of other Democrat representatives, including um, House Affairs Committee Chairman Gregory Meeks. And he said nothing is going to decrease. So the timing of this is incredibly interesting because nothing is going to decrease. And it certainly is going to ramp up in terms of the aid right now, this trip comes just two days after the president has requested from appropriations from Congress $33 billion for Ukraine. That will be to the remainder of the fiscal year, to the end of September. This is going to be more military assistance, economic assistance, and humanitarian assistance. And while Speaker Pelosi was there with only Democratic representatives, there is a lot of bipartisan support in Congress for this type of aid. The Republicans are looking a little bit closer at that $33 billion top-line figure. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern in Washington. We thank you so much. From Washington, let's go to Omaha, Nebraska. That's where on Saturday Berkshire Hathaway held their annual shareholder meeting, the first in person since 2019. Bloomberg's Laura Wright was across the event. Laura, what were the key takeaways? It was the largest buying spree at Berkshire Hathaway since records began back in 2008. And it explains why the seventh largest component of the S&P 500 is getting a lift in pre-market trading. Now, that buying spree was driven by a thesis that buying companies is more advantageous than share buybacks in the current environment. Cash on the balance sheet stands at just over $100 billion. That is less than the $144 billion at the end of last year and still higher than Warren Buffett's comfort threshold, which is $30 billion. Now, Buffett and Charlie Munger, his vice chairman, are still vehemently against cryptocurrencies. They prefer productive assets such as farmland or property. Over at Bloomberg Intelligence, analysts believe that diverse portfolio of businesses at Berkshire Hathaway enables the team to transcend inflation and supply chain woes. In terms of action during the first quarter, Berkshire Hathaway increased their stakes in companies like HP and Occidental Petroleum. But most notable are the higher stakes in the energy company Chevron and the gaming company Activision Blizzard. That stake in Chevron now stands just shy of $26 billion. At the end of last year, it was less than $5 billion. That Activision Blizzard stake now 9.5%, up from less than 2% at the end of last year. And that is a classic deal arbitrage play, considering Microsoft have an outstanding bid on the gaming company. But no update on succession than what we know already. All right, Bloomberg's Laura Wright, thank you so much for that roundup. Now let's get a roundup of some stocks moving in pre-market trading here in the U.S. I want to begin with the big laggards of Friday's session. Heavyweights, Amazon and Apple that took the broader market 
deeply into the red. Of course, for Amazon, it saw its worst day since 2006, down more than 14% in the Friday session after that disappointing forecast. Apple was down about 3.7%, but a tiny, tiny bit of relief coming into the shares on this Monday morning. Amazon's up about half a percent in early hours. Apple by about a quarter of 1%. One other stock I wanted to mention moving lower today is Freeport McMoran. Of course, you do have copper prices under some pressure. Futures down about 3%. That largely is probably a China story after the week, weaker data out over the weekend signals maybe not such good things about metals demand as a result Freeport McMoran down about 1.7 percent before the bell guy. Okay Kelly what have we got coming up uh, we're going to focus back on what's happening with these markets we're going to speak to Raj Shant uh, an equity portfolio specialist at Jenison Associates uh, and later today business titans they're going to be speaking at the Milken Institute Global Conference it's taking place in LA we're going to hear from city CEO Jane Fraser Citadel founder Ken Griffin Apollo's Mark Rowan it's a pretty good lineup. Definitely going to want to tune in for that. This is Bloomberg. is Bloomer Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Preeti Gupta with Kaylee Lines in New York and Guy Johnson in London. Matt Miller and Anna Edwards are off today. Let's talk about what actually did well. We know we're coming off one of the worst months in history, not just for the stock market, but for the bond market as well. But take a look at what is happening uh, to our TV audience, for our radio audience, just bear with me here. Dollar strength seemed to be April story. One of the best months for the dollar, actually going all the way back to 2012. It really speaks to the fact that a lot of the volatility was in the currency market. A lot of the flows went straight into the dollar. And a lot of this might simply be a function of a very hawkish Federal Reserve that's really leading the charge in terms of those interest rate hikes. So what does it mean for assets in the rest of the world? The ECB, the PBOC, the BOJ. For that, let's break it all down with Christine Aquino, Bloomberg Markets Editor. She joins us now. Christine, I'm curious about this dollar strength story. What does it mean for those uh, who are perhaps looking at the carry trade in the yuan or in other EM currencies? Well, Critty, it's going to be really, really interesting because, as you mentioned, you know, a lot of the dollar strength, definitely a function of that expectation that the Fed will really open the way for bumper rate hikes starting this week, a 50 basis point rate hike basically baked into markets. But then on the other hand, there is also this haven bid that we really saw ramp up over the last couple of weeks for the dollar. That's, of course, a function of what we saw, particularly in China. A lot of worries there regarding the economic slowdown and the impact of the lockdowns and also worries about Japan, what the weekend is doing for policy there and really the economy in general, especially given the pace of the move in the currency. And so all of this really amounting to just dominance in the dollar, as you mentioned, is one of the best performances of the dollar over the past decade. And it's likely that we see this sort of Tina action in the dollar continuing as we kick off the Federal Reserve rate hikes this week. Well, Christine, you mentioned China. I want to talk more about that just briefly because obviously really weak PMI data over the weekend. China has had words to say that they will promise to shore up the economy in some sense. Will that actually be followed by action? That is definitely the big question for markets, Kaylee. And I think it really is now this sort of process in China where they're kind of restarting, you know, that market addiction to stimulus, right? We've heard uh, the, the authorities in China reassuring investors last week that they're there to support the economy. They're there to support markets. It's safe to pile back in. But then it got hit by really bad economic data over the weekend with those PMIs really back towards those uh, pandemic levels. And so I think now investors are waiting for concrete action. That's really what they're looking for. And I think there is the danger here of China restarting the cycle of markets addiction to stimulus where they're going to have to keep going with not just the rhetoric but concrete action to keep sentiment there supported. Christine, great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. Bluebird's Christine Aquino. Uh, and for more market analysis, of course, you know where to go. Check out MLIV on your Bloomberg Markets Live. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Kriti Gupta in New York and Guy Johnson in London. Anna Edwards and Matt Miller are off today. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. In India, a blistering heat wave has scorched wheat fields, reducing yields in the world's second biggest grower. That could be a serious blow to global supplies after Russia's war in Ukraine upended trade flows out of the Black Sea breadbasket region. The U.S. Homeland Security chief warns that immigration could be strained by the end of a fast-track deportation policy. Alejandro Mayorkas says that that could result in a surge of up to 18,000 migrants at the southern border. The Biden administration is preparing to lift the policy on May 23rd. In Germany, the embattled landlord Adler Group fell the most ever. The company posted a $1.2 billion loss in annual results that its own auditor, KPMG, declined to endorse. That led a number of board resignations. Uh, today, Adler wrote down more than a billion dollars of goodwill related to its Consist development business. And Qantas has revived a plan for the world's longest nonstop flights. They would connect Australia's east coast with New York and London. The airline says it's buying 12 Airbus A350-1000s that can make the 20-hour journeys. Qantas will begin service from Sydney in 2025. Not sure I'm eager to sign up for a flight that long. Coming up, we'll get back to the markets and speak with Raj Shant, an equity portfolio strategist at Jensen Associates. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition, and here is what you need to know. U.S. stocks starting to stabilize after Friday's massive sell-off. European equities are playing catch-up. They were down hard earlier, beginning to find a little bit of form now. Weak Chinese PMI data really not helping, though. Buffett is buying big, though. Berkshire Hathaway made $41 billion worth of net purchases in the first quarter. That's the most in at least a decade. Berkshire boosting its stakes in Chevron and the video game maker Activision, Activision Blizzard. And Hungary is drawing a red line. Prime Minister Viktor Orban's government promises to veto any EU attempt to sanction Russian energy. The EU is set to propose a ban on Russian oil by the end of the year. I'm Guy Johnson in London. Kriti Gupta and Kayleigh Lines are in New York. Anna Edwards and Matt Miller are both off today. Kriti, what does the early action look like stateside? Well, it's changed a little bit in the last 30 minutes that we've seen, Guy. You started to see a little bit more strength in futures, up about five-tenths of 1%. What you are also seeing is a worsening picture for the crude market. 101 on NYMEX crude, you're seeing about a 2.8% decline. Remember, we are still waiting for those Treasury markets to open up, given that UK trading uh, was closed today. Bitcoin also up 1.7%. But, Guy, this, I think the real kind of gist of the market right now is that as you see a worsening crude picture, futures seem to inch higher and higher. That correlation of lower crude, AKA lower inflation, really boost, boosting futures. That was a correlation that broke down last week, Kaylee. Let's see if it comes back in today. Yeah, and of course, a lot of that decline in oil today has to do with the China story. Is the China story more of a growth concern or an inflationary one? I think that's a question we will continue to ask. Now, as for some stocks moving in free market trading here in the U.S., I want to point to a few moving in relation to none other than the Oracle of Omaha. Guy was talking about the Berkshire uh, Hathaway shareholder meeting that happened over the weekend. Warren Buffett upping his stakes in companies like Activision Blizzard now up to 9.5 percent. Bit of an R play on the Microsoft merger, an assumption that that deal will indeed close. You have Activision up about 3% in early hours as a result. Buffett also boosting his stake in Chevron to just shy of $26 billion. Not a lot of follow through for the stock, though, which is lower by about half of 1%, likely in tandem with that oil story. And then Berkshire itself up about 7 tenths of 1%. One other stock I wanted to point to, uh, wanted to point to was the down drag on the markets yesterday, that or on Friday, rather. That would be Amazon, of course, had its worst day since 2006, down 14%, just the slightest little bit of relief coming into that stock in early hours this morning guy up about half of a percent before the bell let's talk about what is happening here in europe as critty was saying kaylee uh, we do have london out today it is a national holiday markets are closed therefore i give you the dax the dax is down by around seven tenths of one percent we're watching what is happening with those chinese pmi data obviously key to the german economy we're also watching this energy story develop potentially uh, an energy embargo coming in the form of oil gas potentially coming later uh, the car sector is down pretty hard today 
Tech's trading lower as well. So the DAX uh, is down by seven tenths of one percent. Euro dollar is still with a 105 handle, but it's off today, it's down by two tenths of one percent. Remember, late, late last week we had a 104 handle. Uh, the German Bund uh, is bid today, so the safe haven working. Uh, and as we were just hearing just a moment ago, Brent crude uh, trading down by 2.6 percent. The relationship with what's happening uh, in equities uh, certainly one you want to pay attention to. Uh, the other thing I want to mention as well is that European volatility gapped higher first thing this morning. Pay attention to that. Quick look at what's happening, Kaylee, with the Russian asset story. Uh, remember, late last week, the Russians dipped in uh, to their domestic dollar reserves to make a dollar payment. We are going to keep a firm eye on what is happening with this energy story. Uh, obviously, a key line of revenue for the Russian economy. Kaylee. All right, Guy. Well, let's get more on these markets after what was an absolutely brutal April. Joining us now is Rajan, managing director at Jenison Associates, a P. Jim company. Raj, it was the worst day for or worst month for most equities since 2020, worst for the Nasdaq 100 since 2008. How optimistic are you feeling as we enter May? It might be a, an extraordinarily contrarian thing to say, but um, looking forwards over the next six months to a year, we're starting to feel really quite optimistic. So the very brutal market movements that you referred to just then really um, play out in terms of the fundamentals and the valuation. So the valuation premium for many of the most interesting and exciting long-term growth companies has been eviscerated. So whether you compare that valuation premium to the market or to value stocks, where we're back to now is really pre-pandemic and even back to the beginning of 2019, late 2018. So it has been a brutal market. Uh, it's only April and the start of the whole year so far has been brutal. But it is an important reset. We are in a different environment. Interest rates are going to be rising. But we may have seen the, the foundations for a better performance going forwards hmm. through this reset of prices and the reset of valuations. Raj, you mentioned the interest rate portion of it. I think that's really what's spooking a lot of investors here, retail or institutional. But I have to ask, what precedent are we looking at? If you look at the last rate hike cycle, technology, growth stocks, they actually outperformed, leading in the entire benchmark higher in the last rate hike cycle. But then if you look at the cycles before that, for example, you didn't see that same dynamic. So which precedent should we really be following? Well, it really depends on your view of how effective central banks are going to be in terms of uh, conquering and reducing inflation. So in particular, what matters most to them and to the market is can they get inflation expectations and interest rate expectations as a result to stabilise and start to come down? And so I think even in the earlier rate cycles going back into the last century, what you saw was that initially when investors start to see that the interest rate cycle is going to start to turn upwards, they start to sell the highest growth and highest multiple stocks. And then the rest of the growth sector tends to suffer to begin with. But actually, as we go through the, the, the rate cycle, the market's focus shifts. It starts, it moves away from how much a rate's going to go up by and when onto what is this going to do for growth, which is really the underlying intention of any rate hike cycle, is to reduce aggregate demand by depressing growth. And so when that shift in focus happens, you tend to see the cyclicals and the value stocks are the ones that face the greater headwind. And actually investors start to uh, return to the more steady secular growth companies. And those tend to okay. pick up market leadership. Raj, I guess one question within that is how long does the cycle go on for in terms of the hikes that we're going to see? Do you think the risk is currently that we see more than the market is pricing from the Fed or less than the market is pricing from the Fed? So we don't make economic forecasts here at Jenison Associates. Uh, or, uh, sure. but, but I would say that in my personal view, uh, there is a risk that um, we see less than the market is currently expecting. So if you look at the US GDP data from last week, if you look at the Chinese PMIs from, from the weekend, what we're beginning to see already is the market's focus is shifting on, wow, you know, we know that rates are going up. We know that, that that's intended to slow activity down. How much could it slow activity down and how soon? And I think, you know, it's a, it's a small step from there to inflation expectations being recalibrated downwards and I think uh, with reference to the, the uh, action in the oil markets this morning, 
you're beginning to see a little, just the very first signs. And I, I wouldn't say it's enough to form an investment strategy on just yet, but you're beginning to see the first signs of the focus shifting from inflation and interest rates to growth. And I think that's the key pivot that then leads to a different kind of market and a yeah. different kind of market leadership. Raj, we're at the point where a lot of people are overweight cash at the moment. Are we at the point where that cash should be deployed? I, I would say that really the only way to tell will be when we can see that inflation expectations and interest rate expectations have stopped rising. So certainly, as you saw in April, that wasn't the case. Uh, and so you know, holding uh, more cash than usual was probably a, a logical and a, and a profitable strategy during the month of April. What we're seeing in terms of the first straws in the wind for macro data, if that continues over the next few weeks, then actually, you know, people might want to put that cash to work. And so, you know, you, you, I think you're at, at, in that kind of data driven environment where when you see that the inflation data coming in less than expected, when you see interest rate expectations for the later parts of this year beginning to fall, then actually you really want to re-examine re your portfolio look at those growth companies that have been hardest hit over the last three or four months and see if there aren't some great bargains there looking out over the next one or two years. Raj, great to catch up. Really interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Raj Shand of Jenison Associates. OK, coming up, a metaverse frenzy crashes Ethereum. We're going to tell you what's going on next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, Ed Morse, Citigroup's Global Head of Commodities Research. That's at 7.45 a.m. in New York, 12.45 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Well, I think part of it, you know, is, is probably failure on messaging from our industry. I think that we haven't done as good of a job as we could and should have done in explaining what are these technologies, what are the products, like what's the use case. Um, and I, I think that, you know, you can talk about it in high level all you want, but again, until you go through on a pretty low level how they would operate in various circumstances, it's hard as a customer to, to, to deeply understand um, what the potential use cases of the technology are. You know, I think the core component of this is it's a way for everyone in the world to have a common ledger that they agree on of accounting that isn't just what one government or one country or one company claims it is, but where there's actually an objective, um, uh, you know, open open network that um, that that isn't sort of manipulatable by by any one party that has transparency as well. FTX CEO Sam Bankman-Fried there speaking last week in the Bahamas on how to fix messaging for crypto newcomers. Now, the creator of popular Bored Ape Yacht Club NFTs launched a sale of virtual land over the weekend that crashed the Ethereum blockchain. It also raised about $320 million worth of the cryptocurrency in the latest offering of its kind. Users scrambled for deeds to 55,000 parcels of land in other side, Yuga Lab's highly anticipated metaverse project. Joining us now with more from Miami is Mike McGlone of Bloomberg Intelligence. So Mike, this is one of those NFT stories that kind of befuddles everyone, gets a lot of attention. When it comes to how this translates into the thesis around Ethereum and Ether in particular, I know you said that it basically has a lot of room for upside potentially here. You published a Bloomberg Intelligence report last week about that. How do you factor in the kind of risk like this, Bored Apes? Well, I think, um, Kayla, you just nailed the key thing from Ethereum, from my standpoint. When you hear about high fees and NFTs, and now it's a problem that crash the network, but bottom line, they're all denominated in Ethereum. So it means demand for Ethereum and also Solana. So that's a key thing that also happened last week, and there was also an issue with Solana, too, because it's a main platform for NFTs. So my, from my standpoint, is. There's a lot of issues out there with NFTs. Digital property rights is one way to look at them. It's a lot for me to try to understand, but I try to narrow down to what I do understand, demand for Ethereum and Solana, which means how I have to do is analyze supply to determine it probably means prices should go up over time. But I think part of what you're seeing happening is a bit of that frenzy and a lot of money flowing around that the Fed's going to be addressing on Wednesday. 
Mike, um, we'll come to the Fed in just a moment, but again, we have an infrastructure issue. Um, the inability to be able to deal with the demand that you reference uh, and, and be able to manage it effectively. In, in terms of how much of a focus there is within the industry to fix some of these problems, uh, is this just a blip that the industry is prepared to accept? Or is there actually serious concern that as we get these spikes, the infrastructure keeps falling down time after time after time? I think it's much more the former um, guy because this is just part of the rapid evolution of a nascent ex, uh, technology asset. And that's the key thing I got out of um, Crypto's Bahamas. It's amazing the amount of talent and smart people focused on building this infrastructure. And yes, this is, you know, it's probably a pretty good test that pushed it to its limits. And okay, now we know what we have to do to address this. So I walked into the hackathon a little bit, which is way out of my area, but it's just so many of those geeks who just figured it out. And you put Sam on there earlier. Sam's more of a markets guy, but he's a quintessential geek that people love. And that's what I came out of that Crypto Bahamas. Is You know how he started out the Crypto Bahamas? It started at 9 a.m. He looks around and goes, man, you people get up really early. So it's just an indication these people will figure it out. And this is a good test for a challenge that they're so waiting to overcome. And, and, and part of that is also regulation. Please bring on the regulation so we know the names, of the, 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 the rules of the game, and we'll move forward. Mike, I've got to ask you about the dollar here. We've been talking about a stronger dollar for weeks now, really roiling the likes of the Japanese yen, uh, the euro even, even the pound. What does that mean in context of Ethereum and Bitcoin, both of which have been largely trading sideways year to date? The dollar has only one way to go, and that's up if you watch cryptos. The number one traded crypto on the planet is Tether. It's a digital do dollar. It's a token made, made possible by Ethereum. And it's a key thing that you learn from cryptos is the market's organically gone to the dollar. Now we have this epic war battle going on, and it's really differentiating. I think the value of free market economies and the value of the American system and the dollar globally versus some of these other autocratic societies that are focusing on not so nice things to do to their neighbors. So to me, that's what I see. I look at this as this, and, what, and uh, cryptos are showing us what Churchill said is what de about democracy. It's the worst form of government except, except for all the others. You're clearly seeing that in the dollar, and I see nothing but the dollar to go higher. You know, yes, that might be a pressure factor for things like gold and Bitcoin, but overall, they all should uh, appreciate together. And I see they're just different kind of assets. But when people say about the demise of the dollar, in cryptos, you see the exact opposite. Fascinating stuff. Mike McGlone of Bloomberg Intelligence, we thank you so much. And tune in to Bloomberg Crypto every Tuesday at 1 p.m. New York time. The weekly show co-hosted by Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines, covering the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. This is Bloomberg. So this is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Guy Johnson in London with Kriti Gupta and Kaylee Lyons in New York. Uh, Anna and Matt both off today. Let's talk turbine shares of wind turbine maker Vestas plunging today uh, as much as 7%. This after the company projected its first loss in a decade uh, as costs related to the company's exit from Russia plus other factors really start to mount. So we're joined now by Christian Weinberg, uh, Bloomberg's Copenhagen bureau chief. Christian, let's talk about Russia first of all. They're exiting from Russia. We're starting to understand the costs. Is that the kind of the centre of what we saw today? Is this all about Russia, this effective warning? Well, it's mainly about Russia for sure. Um, Vestas is making a write, write down that's close to half a billion dollars related to Russia. And it's not as if Russia is a big market for Vestas. Uh, last year, only about 3% of the turbines that Vestas installed globally were in Russia. But it shows just how painful it is for a company to rip out Russia from its uh, portfolio. Well, a lot of these uh, wind turbine makers, green solutions, are supposed to be the future, Christian. Why are we seeing such a major loss? Is it solely Russia or is there something else at play here? There are other items as well that are bad news for, for Vestas in the report here today. One of them being uh, that they need to adjust their, their production capacity in, in, the, in Asia. Uh, they also still fighting higher raw material costs. Remember that the wind turbines are mainly made out of steel and steel prices have been going up. They also have supply chain issues. 
Now, all these things, uh, obviously, investors, investors are hoping that they are all short term and that once these things have been solved, investors can then benefit from the longer, ben the, the longer uh, tailwinds that you mentioned with uh, the green transition here in the wake of, uh, of uh, uh, Europe and the U.S. weaning itself off uh, Russian energy. And we know, of course, that there's a lot of funds flowing into those green solutions as well. I have to ask, though, given the wall of worry that you just outlined, is there any good news into the Vesta's earnings? Yes, actually, the uh, Vestas was able to raise their prices per uh, their average selling price per turbine, which has been a key goal for CEO Henrik Andersen, and uh, he has succeeded to do that in the first quarter. And um, uh, that is good news for uh, investors. Obviously, the problem here is that inflation rates are keep rising, so this will be an ongoing battle. It's not just solved with one price hike for Vestas. They will need to keep rising prices as long as inflation, especially for things like steel and, and, other, and transport costs, remain, uh, still go up at, a, at an unprecedented level. Well, Bloomberg's Christian Weinberg in Copenhagen, we thank you so much for the report on Vesta. Guy, a lot going on uh, for the rest of the week, but let's look at what we're watching today. For me, it's going to be all about that U.S. manufacturing data, essentially some of the issues that Christian just outlined, the supply chain issues, the COVID lockdowns, yep. and of course, uh, the ramifications of the war in Ukraine. All of that might actually reflect in the improvement or lack of improvement, I should say, in the ISM manufacturing data that, of course, coming at 10 a.m. this morning, Guy. So I'm going to be watching Narendra Modi. Um, the Indian leader is in Europe. He's going to be in Germany today. Uh, there is talk that Olaf Scholz, the German chancellor, is going to extend uh, an invitation to the G7. It's really interesting to see how India manages this trip, how Narendra Modi manages this trip. Uh, there is concern in Europe that he is not doing enough to push back against the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Russia and India have very, very uh, sort of strong connections. And there is a hope that maybe, actually, he can be kind of pushed off the fence, as it were, uh, and uh, potentially we could find ourselves in a situation where he provides maybe some more vocal backing for Ukraine and starts to push back a little bit more and uses his influence a little bit more in pushing back against Russia. So we'll see that story develop, I think, throughout today. Yeah, and a crucial player when it comes to the energy space. We know India is the third largest oil-consuming nation in the world after China and, of course, after the United States, which is the first. We also have to mention uh, India is the top defense customer from Russia yep. as well. So there are a lot of economic ties uh, that we'll see if can really be pulled apart here. Yeah, it's interesting, though, because you think about the, the amount of energy it's consuming. In fact, it's starting to sign uh, even more energy contracts with Russia. So a huge amount of energy uh, flowing towards India from Russia uh, in the form of oil. Obviously, there is a potential story further down the road for more gas to be delivered there as well. Uh, and I think Europe wants to be in a position where, as it starts to cut, cut Russia off, that energy, those molecules don't find their way elsewhere. We already know they're starting to find their way towards China uh, and maybe limiting uh, the optionality that Vladimir Putin has in terms of selling those molecules elsewhere, uh, I think is going to be a really key component uh, of this trip. It's going to be fascinating, fascinating to see Olaf Schultz and Narendra Modi uh, and how they, diff how, they, how they spin this story differently. Yeah, then you add in just simply the fiscal issues that India is having. They really framed it as, oh, it's a no-brainer. Of course we're going to buy Brent at a discount from Russia. Can they continue that narrative is really the question. Absolutely. So we're going to carry on all of, the, uh, all of this uh, a little bit later on with a really interesting conversation uh, with uh, Ed Morse. He is the Global Head of Commodities Research at Citigroup. Uh, he is amongst the fantastic lineup of guests uh, that surveillance has coming up. Uh, obviously a huge week uh, for central banks, Bank of England, but the main event coming up, the Fed. So we're going to start to set that week up for you. Surveillance is coming up next. This is Bloomberg.